It's okay, Jonathan. I'll see you later. Too much blood. Calm yourself. You think I didn't notice? Stop your staring and get me to an hospital, you ass. Insulting a good Samaritan. Not exactly the way to get rescued. All right, all right. Sorry, I am in pain here. We got to spill it out onto the street, and you're yabbering on. Yes, that's a very nasty wound you've got there. Take my word, I was... I am a doctor, Dr. Jonathan Reed. <sighs> Name's Clay Cox. I'd appreciate you helping me to a better place, Doc. Follow me, Mr. Cox. Let me assist you to that better place. It is wise for the huntsman to sometimes let his prey go, but no famished hunter can run for long. Good evening, sir. So it is true. The famous Dr. Reed has joined us. I can't think of any better news during these terrible times. Do we know each other? Actually, yes. We met once before at the Rockefeller University in New York. Dr. Tippett, yes, I remember. I was assisting Professor Carell in his research about coronary bypasses. He had nothing but praise for you. He was also very confident about your future. And look at you now. Eminent surgeon and blood transfusion specialist. What is the Pembroke Hospital situation? And please, speak freely. 
This hospital is not exactly the best of London. I'm sure you are used to working in a better environment. Come on, I don't have all night. It's more than enough. In any case, the personnel of a hospital are much more important to me than the building. Don't be misled by appearances, Dr. Reed. This hospital does not lack talented people. It just lacks hope. What can you tell me about the staff in the hospital? Some are really good, and others are not so good. But during this troubled period, there is no time for slander. I prefer to focus on the positive character traits. Tell me more about cherished people, then. Nurse Brannigan is a pearl. She is the most helpful and dedicated nurse I've ever worked with. A clever and cheerful woman. You really seem to admire her skills. I'll go even further. If she was a man, she would be a damn fine practitioner. Any opinion about the management? I don't always agree with Dr. Swansea's reserve, but I must admit he does all he can to keep this facility running during this crisis. Ah, yes, the burden of command. I was fed up with this concept while serving as a medical officer. Don't get me wrong. Swansea's a good administrator. I just wish he would get out of his office down again. Goodbye, Dr. Tippett. Doctor, where have you been? I've little time to play hide-and-seek with new staff members, no matter how illustrious they may be. I found a wounded man by the docks. He answers to the name of Clay Cox. He requires urgent medical attention. Already making the rounds? That's the Pembroke spirit. I'll ask our porter, Milton, to bring him back immediately. Thank you, nurse. What can I do for you? Dr. Swansea insisted we provide you a quiet office. You'll find it on the second floor with your name on the door. Thank you. Nurse Crane, isn't it? Yes, Dorothy Crane. Welcome to Pembroke Hospital, Dr. Reed. Your office has been prepared. I would like to ask a few questions first. And Mr. Hampton, the patient we brought in, how does he fare? I gave him a sedative to help him sleep. Poor thing was in quite a state of shock. What kind of man is Dr. Swansea? Well, you accepted the job from him. I thought you would have known about your employer. Apologies, I've only just met him the once. This is sudden. I've only just returned to England. Dr. Swansea is a brilliant surgeon and the most compassionate physician. It's right to assume Dr. Swansea knows far more about me than I do about him. You'll get to know him soon enough, and better than me. The administrator has better things to do than mix with us. If you could point me in the direction of my room again, nurse. Second floor of the hospital, left after the stairs. It's the last vacant office at the end of the corridor. Thank you, Nurse Crane. Good evening, nurse. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed, the new surgeon here at the Pembroke. Dr. Swansea has already told us about you, sir. I'm nurse Gwyneth Brannigan. Welcome to the Pembroke Hospital. Did he really? It's a good thing I wasn't hoping to keep a low profile. All members of staff have already read about your new blood transfusion technique. Dr. Swansea made sure of that. I see. Well, I'm a little surprised. I suppose I'll just have to deal with this unexpected notoriety. You must know, blood transfusions are Dr. Swansea's primary subject of research. He is convinced it is the future. How are things here? Not good, to say the least. We're struggling against an invisible enemy, 
more lethal than any bullet from a gun. It's hard, Doctor. Do you require medical assistance, nurse? Thank you for your concern, but I'm fine. Why does Dr. Tippett's claim you're the main reason he keeps working, despite his fatigue? If it wasn't for him, I probably would have left the Pembroke years ago. Dr. Tippett's does not think of you as just a nurse anymore, does he? If you're suggesting he's not taking my gender into consideration when it comes to medical practice and knowledge, I really hope he doesn't. How are things here? Not good, just... An invisible enemy. Quite a poetic term for a disease, especially from a nurse. Sorry, Doctor. These last few weeks have been exhausting. We could all do with a good night's sleep. Do you think this hospital can survive the epidemic? We are all volunteers here, and we're trying to hold fast, but... How do we beat an invisible killer? Some nurses have already resigned. I'm not familiar with all the staff yet. Perhaps you could help me. Brilliant professionals, most of them. Dr. Swansea has a gift for recruiting talent. Most of them? Is there a problem I should know about, nurse? It would be inappropriate for me to speak ill of a colleague. Is there anyone that stands out? Well, I have never met someone as dedicated as Dr. Tippett's. He should be a standard for us all here. If only he were young. Why should his age be a problem? I guess it's fair to say he's always pushing himself to the limits. He just doesn't know when to stop and get some rest. Nurse Brannigan, if you do know something, please tell me. Anything you say will be held in confidence. No. I may disagree with some conduct. But in the end, everybody is doing their best. Goodbye, nurse. Call me if you need assistance. Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed. I'm new here. I've already heard about you, Dr. Reed. I'm Milton Hooks, the ambulance driver for this shithole of a hospital. That's quite a blunt introduction, Mr. Hooks. You can call me Milton. I like to speak my mind, Dr. Reed. Perk of the job. Don't judge me, and I won't judge you. I'm not sure I understand what you're talking about. Well, I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure a gun can't be used as a surgical instrument. You have a keen eye. I learned to shoot during the war, and have carried one ever since. Old habits die hard. No need to explain, Dr. Reed. And if you ever need a better gun, remember, I may have something for you. How is the situation around here? You want to hear the situation is all right? It's fucking awful. We lack everything, and it's getting worse every day. So what do you do exactly in this hospital? Apart from smuggling guns, I mean. I've been an ambulance driver since... too long, I guess. I'll bring sick people here night and day. It's a dirty job, but I get it done. Most of the time. Since you're on the front line, how is the sanitary situation in this vicinity? It's a complete disaster. It's even getting dangerous to enter some streets or buildings. Even the locals attack you. It sounds like things have been a bit rough recently. What's happened? Yesterday I got attacked by the patient I was bringing in. I escaped from the hospital's garden, but I lost my wallet when I was running. You left an infected patient outside the hospital. That's incredibly dangerous. Go there yourself if you want, but be careful, doctor. I'd rather not bring your dead body back. Thank you. 
Do you need any medical help, Milton? I'm fine, Doc. Physically, at least. But I would give everything to be in a better place right now. How is this? You want it? So what do you do exactly? I've been in... Are you really smuggling weapons through the hospital? And why not? I've already been attacked by patients, you know. And by gang members willing to steal my money. But you're not defending yourself. You're selling guns to civilians. You keep people alive your own way, Doctor. I offer them another way to protect their health. I'd like... Wise choice, Dr. Reed. A... Dr. Swansea is right. This place seems perfect to conduct my research. Good evening, miss. I'm Dr. Reed, the new surgeon at the Pembroke Hospital. And who are you? Your name has no meaning to me, mortal. You're nothing but dust blown by the winds of eternity. I beg your pardon? What are you begging for, mortal? My clemency? Well. Tonight, maybe I'm inclined to mercy. You'll never forget the night you met Thelma Howcroft. You keep calling me mortal. Why is that? And if I'm mortal, what are you? Well, Dr. Reed, if you must know, I'm a vampire. Do you require my services, Miss Howcroft? I have no need for your medicine, Dr. Reed. Blood is the only drug I need. And why do you believe you're a vampire? I don't need to believe anything. It is what I am. It is what I feel within this hollow shell of flesh. Please, describe to me how you feel. What is it like to be a vampire? I can hear my body crumble from the inside as my flesh cracks and fades. I sense the last pulse of postulant blood within my drying veins. I need new blood. I see. Have you ever heard of Cotard syndrome, Miss Howcroft? Never. It's a mental illness discovered by a French neurologist named Jules Cotard. The affected patients are delusional. They believe that they are putrefying, that they are dead, a, a ghost or a ghoul, or in your case, a vampire. Delusional, you say? Oh, sad and petty mortal. You can't even begin to understand the concept of immortality. And you think it is I who am delusional. I'm assuming you must be a patient here. Am I right, Miss Howard? It's only a cover to hide from my enemies. I can leave whenever I want. As a woman, a, a spirit, fog, or bat. Who are these enemies you mentioned? Can you describe them? I cannot say for sure. But I sense their eyes on me from nearby. I, I, I feel them watching me every time I visit the garden near the morgue. The staff here are not your enemy. They're here to help you, to care for you. I'm not speaking of the doctors in white. I'm speaking of the men and women who hunt me, for I am a vampire. I see. Don't worry. These people will not find you here. I'll personally make sure they leave you alone. Thank you, mortal. But do not interfere with them, for you are no match for those that hunt me. Who are you really, Miss Howcroft? 
I mean, apart from being a vampire. Is that not enough for you, puny mortal? What do you require? Hmm? Proof of my powers? I'm curious to know who you were before becoming a vampire. No, it was such a long time ago, I don't remember. Centuries of unholy life can have strange effects on one's minds, you see? I'll leave you, Mistress of the Dark, to your nocturnal activities. Good evening, nurse. Good evening, doctor. I don't think we've been introduced yet. My name is Pippa Hawkins. And I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed. Dr. Swansea has recently offered me a position in this hospital. Well, it's a euphemism that your help will be appreciated, doctor. How would you describe the situation at the Pembroke Hospital? It's serious. The flu is wreaking havoc amongst the staff and patients. We are running out of everything. You must get a hold of yourself, nurse. <sighs> Sorry. I'm exhausted. No one has any idea when this epidemic will be over. Nurse Hawkins, the Spanish flu won't last forever. Even the Black Plague didn't kill everyone. I wish I could believe you. But what if this epidemic was worse? What if in the end, nobody was spared? How long have you been a nurse? Well, long enough to see that the epidemic is winning. And no matter how qualified you are, don't tell me you'll change that. I don't like your attitude, Nurse Hawkins. Pessimism can be as lethal as the epidemic in times like these. <laughs> Sorry, Doctor. I don't want to sound bitter. But I'm just too tired to give a pep talk like Nurse Brannigan. How is the Pembroke staff coping with the epidemic? Well, not well. Milton, the ambulance driver, is even more grumpy than usual, especially concerning doctors. Why is Milton grumpy on a daily basis? Is it just an act? Milton's not the kind of man who's bothered about a bad reputation, whether he deserved it or not. Why does Milton dislike doctors? I don't know. Just ask him. But be warned. Milton is not the chatty type. Do you need medical help yourself, nurse? I'm fine, really. I just need to sleep. Goodbye, Nurse Hawkins. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? Unless you're here to fix my face. No. I don't think you can help me. I'm Dr. Reed. I've recently taken the position of head surgeon here. War injuries, am I right? You guessed right, Doctor. German shell took my pretty little mug right off. But they still call me Thomas Elwood. How is your stay with us, Mr. Elwood? Oh, it's bliss. I just escaped death in the trenches to be surrounded again by the moans of the dying. Can I ask you precisely why you're a patient here? It's the pain, sir. The drugs don't work. It just hurts under the scars, if you get my drift. Can I do anything for your pain? Nurses gave me a bunch of pills. No effect told you. It's like the flames are under my skin, burning away. Who is treating you? Is someone in particular looking after your case? Nobody since the old and tired doctor spoke to me. Started to think I was forgotten about. Wouldn't blame you. You don't seem worried by that. My face hurts so much more when I smile or cry. I've learned it's easier not to speak. But be assured, I'm smiling inside.
Where were you stationed, sir? Did you serve for long? I really don't want to talk about all this shit. No offense. I was pushing too much. I served in France myself. I just wanted to know what happened to you. You were an officer, weren't you? Then I doubt we fought the same war, sir. No offense. How close are you to Miss Horcroft? Are you aware that she thinks she is a vampire? To wait for her next nibble is the best reason to stay here. Every time she approaches my bed, she treats me like something tasty. A normal person. Aren't you afraid? She may hurt you if the game goes too far. She's quite harmless, I can assure you. Her head's broken inside, is all. While I'm busted on the outside. But she's still beautiful. Living proof that there's hope for me. So do you let her bite you? You know that's not sanitary. And why not? She's only supping a few drops of me blood. And the pain. It's real for once. She could decide to bite less willing patients. Then it's another good reason for me to stay here, Doctor. You do realize she's mentally disturbed. It's called the Kotar Syndrome. She truly believes she's a vampire. In her madness, she never refers to my scars. And frankly, if I could, I'd join her world. It seems much more fun than the real one. Soldier, do you need assistance? I'm fine. Just do something for this pain, will you? That's all I'm asking. Goodbye for now, Mr. Elwood. Damn disgust on every street corner. I cannot enter. Good evening, Doctor. I believe we're going to be working together. Dr. Reed. Dr. Swansea informed us of your arrival, but I could not dare to believe we'd have such good fortune. Such an honor, sir. <laughs> Thank you. And you are? I am Thoreau Strickland. Dr. Thoreau Strickland. I'm a great admirer of your work, Dr. Reed. Please, could you tell me something about yourself? I'm a great admirer of your work concerning blood transfusion, Dr. Reed. I run my own experiments. I'm convinced it's the future. What made you choose to be a doctor? I'm not ashamed to admit you and your work have inspired me. I am honored to have the opportunity to work by your side. It's always a pleasure to share scientific and medical knowledge with someone eager to learn. I'll be glad to help you if I can. This epidemic may be the century's most terrible disaster, but I'm convinced that we, as doctors, are the only ones able to defeat it. I based my technique on my mentor's research. He helped me perfect my method. What is yours? I'd rather not talk about it. For now, it's just theories at first approach. My process is purely experimental and unsuccessful. As long as you're cautious and methodical, you may remain empty-handed, but you won't fail. You're not the first one to warn me, but I am convinced knowledge is the main weapon against the ravages of this epidemic. What can you tell me about the Pembroke? Well, it has always been an honor to work with Dr. Swansea. With your arrival, I can't think of a better opportunity to learn about blood transfusion. You seem quite optimistic. It's a rare and precious attitude in these difficult times. 
I'm convinced that this epidemic is a test. A test of endurance and dedication for us men of science. Questions remain about our capacity to resolve the situation. True, true. Last summer, during the first wave of the epidemic, I used to joke with Milton about the extra work. We're not smiling now. Do you need help with anything in particular? Well, yes, maybe. I'm waiting for a batch of products I ordered for my personal research, yet my supplier seems to have vanished. Do you want me to play the errand boy for you? Oh no, Dr. Reed. But if you went personally to his shop, what with your reputation and all, he wouldn't dare to refuse the products I need. I see. Well, give me the address, for I may pass by if I have time. Tell me more about your willingness to experiment with new medical techniques. Harvey Fiddick is a patient suffering from a severe injury that could cripple him if not treated correctly. I'm convinced your blood transfusion technique could help him. What is it you really want? To save him? Or to prove your point? Fair question. I want nothing but to save my patient, Dr. Reed. Especially since I know Mr. Fiddick's story. Tell me Mr. Fiddick's story. Our first diagnosis was compromised because Mr. Fiddick lied to us about the real origin of his injury. He first claimed it was an accident. But why would he hide such crucial information from us? Because he is a proud father. Ashamed of putting his children at risk because of his own negligence. This personal involvement could also appear to be a lack of impartiality. You must know that a good surgeon must remain neutral. I agree. But that does not excuse Dr. Ackroyd's behavior, a man who did not even take time to converse with his patient. Do you think keeping his distance was a mistake? All I know is that I'm taking care of human beings with desires, hopes and fears, not some biological machine comprised of blood, bones and flesh. Do you need my medical attention, dear colleague? You don't have to worry about me, Dr. Reed. I am here to assist you, not to be a burden. Goodbye, Dr. Strickland. Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Reed. May I help you? I don't know if a third opinion is needed. Your colleagues are already arguing about my condition. I see. Would you mind telling me more about your situation? I'm Harvey Fiddick. All I want is to get me bloody arm fixed properly. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Fiddick. I'm just a regular guy waiting to get his arm fixed, so I can return to work and to my family. I was more curious about what you were doing before being hospitalized. I'm a carpenter, and a good one too. But that means I need both arms to feed my family, Dr. Reed. Tell me about the doctors who are arguing about your case. Strickland and Ackroyd. They both want the best for me, but there's a lot of pride there. Doctors are no different from carpenters, it seems. What do you mean? I often had professional arguments with rivals on a building site. Difference is I disagreed about wooden nails, not flesh and bones. Are you satisfied with your treatment here? Well, it's clear that I've chosen a bad time to be injured. Forgive my bluntness. But you seem overwhelmed by cases of the flu. I won't lie to you about it. I'm afraid we are. Are you sure you don't want to operate yourself, Dr. Reed? I have the feeling you're very capable. And your colleagues seem to think so too. In other circumstances, you would be right. But for now, I don't think I can take on the responsibility. My apologies. Tell me about your injury, Harvey. Why do you feel so guilty about it? My wife died because of me. And now I may lose everything because I've been careless enough to hurt myself. What an arsehole. How could your job be responsible for your wife's death? I was working a double. She went out to bring me a hot meal and got caught in a German bomb raid. You can't hold yourself responsible for your injury, Mr. Fiddick. 
Unless you tried to hurt yourself. Of course I didn't hurt myself. But I can't work until my arm is fixed. My children need to eat, Doctor. Tell me more about the death of your wife, Harvey. 1915. I was in the army. Building workshops for the Royal Flying Corps. Helen was happy I wasn't sent to the front. What happened? The Germans sent Zeppelins to bomb the construction site, but they missed their target. My wife was bringing my dinner when the bombs fell. I'm sorry for your loss. So many died during the bombings. I served in France and witnessed the carnage there. I would like to say that she didn't suffer. Truth is, I have no idea. I just know that I'm all that me kids have. Poor little bleeders. How are your children after losing their mother? They were smaller then. The only good thing about this is my Ellen didn't bring them with her that night. Is there anything else that's bothering you? Can I help in any way? I'm all right. Considering the state of this place, I should consider myself lucky, I guess. Goodbye for now, Mr. Fiddick. I'll see you later. I will not let you down. It's locked. Good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Reed. I believe we're going to be colleagues. Reed? Yes, I've been informed about your arrival. I'm Waverly Aykroyd. Welcome aboard, I suppose. Does my arrival inconvenience you in some way, Dr. Aykroyd? Let us just say that I don't particularly share Dr. Swanson's enthusiasm for hiring you. What we need here are reliable professionals, not overrated dabblers. If you have a problem with me, Dr. Aykroyd, please feel free to tell me. Dr. Swansea has imposed your presence on this hospital without asking anyone's advice. The benefit of his position. But I don't agree with it. I know we've never met before, but I believe this hospital could use all the help it can get. You will agree with that, I'm sure. Oh, but I have heard about you, Dr. Reed. Of course, you can't say the same about me since I have not wasted my time courting the press. There is no need for such animosity between us. Don't you think the epidemic is already enough to deal with? That is one point we could agree on. And that is precisely why I want to be sure that you will be of help to this hospital instead of a burden. Since your tenure in this hospital is longer than mine, Perhaps you can tell me more about this place. Let's just say I'm tired of the carelessness around me. I have always respected the skills of Dr. Swansea, but over time, his enthusiasm has become displaced. Carelessness? Exactly what are you talking about? We're here to save lives. The people who trust us are not volunteering for experimentation. They're here to be healed. I don't intend to run any radical experiments, Doctor. Even if I, as any good practitioner should, express an interest in pushing the boundaries of medical research. Modern medical methods were created through audacity and ego. But there are rules in our line of work, and they're here to protect our patients. Tell me, Waverley, what do you think of Dr. Strickland's enthusiasm for his experimental research? Strickland is playing with his patients' lives for pride and glory. Now that, sir, is unethical. 
Are you thinking about something in particular? Harvey Fiddick needs delicate surgery. I believe we should stick to the usual procedure. But my young colleague obviously disagrees. And are you not afraid that your rivalry with Strickland may be blinding you? Rivalry? I guess you could call it that. But I will never be childish enough to let my personal feelings affect my judgment. Why do you wish to lead this surgery? I strongly believe that Mr. Fiddick should not be butchered to test an unproven procedure. If you are going to lead this surgery, I'm trusting you to assume the consequences of your actions, whatever the result. I'm not the kind of man who runs away from his responsibilities, Dr. Reed. There is no need for you to be looking over my shoulder. I don't know what you've heard about me, but I have already proved my value as a practitioner. I don't question your skills, Dr. Reed, but your motive. Is it money? Fame? Or are you truly dedicated? And what exactly is that supposed to mean? I served in the war just like you. But unlike you, I did not use the wounded to play the modern sorcerer. Be careful what you insinuate, Dr. Aykroyd. I only want you to admit you used those men to improve your theories. Knowledge has always been and will remain our main weapon. And it has always come at a price. And personal initiative. It is not a question of initiative. It is a question of integrity. These men and women have put their faith in us, Dr. Reed. It seems you have bad memories of your military service. I refuse to see this industrial slaughter as scientific progress. War only reveals the worst in men. We can at least agree on something, Dr. Aykroyd. Do you need my assistance? Not at all. I am sure that you are used to gaining people's trust with your impressive skills. Well, it will not be the case with me. Thank you for your time. We'll talk later. Good evening. I'm Dr. Reed. Can I help at all? No. Really? Why are you here, then? I don't want to talk. My throat hurts too much. I suppose that this pain is the reason you're here. Is someone taking care of you? Yes. And um, no. Could you at least tell me your name, sir? Mortimer. Mortimer Goswick. How painful is your throat, Mr. Goswick? So painful I'd rather not talk at all, Doctor. I'm sure you realize a doctor and his patient have to communicate, sir. Would it help if I gave you some paper and a pen? Not really. I see. Then maybe it's not just your throat that hurts, Mr. Goswick. Perhaps your sore throat is just the consequence of something more hurtful. Yes, maybe. But I don't want to talk or even write about it now. How petro pain I'll let you Good evening, sir. Good evening, Miss. I'm okay. Tell me. I don't want to. I have to go. I'm alright. Don't waste your time with me. Good evening, madam. Can I help you? It's my son who needs you, sir. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reed. How can I help your son? I'm Beatrice Goswick, mother of Mortimer Goswick. Could you check on him, please, Dr. Reed? I've heard much of your talents as a physician. What can you tell me about yourself, Mrs. Goswick? Not much to say. Just take care of my Mortimer and I'll cover all the expenses. That's all that matters. May I ask if you have an occupation, Mrs. Goswick? I'm a teacher by profession. I teach young women who are more ambitious about their futures than their families. Are you really that rich? Most of the patients here are of a more humble origin, if I may say so. Yes, thanks to my husband. May he 
you rest in peace. I can cover any needed medical expenses. What do you think of your reception here? Any complaints? I have had the uttermost reservations about this hospital since we arrived. But we had no other choice, considering the state of emergency. Is there something in particular that's bothering you? Some of the staff were not especially welcoming. I suspect they're not accustomed to dealing with patients of such social standing. Tell me more about your arrival at the Pembroke Hospital. What gave you such a bad first impression? The ambulance driver was quite rude, for a start. And that nurse, Miss Hawkins, seems to have quite a dubious attitude. What do you mean? She managed to secure a bed for my son despite the epidemic. It was a relief, but it wasn't cheap. She charged you? For a bed. Yes, and I paid without question, considering the urgency of the situation. I share your concern, Mrs. Goswick. Be sure that I'll talk to the people involved. I don't expect compensation, Dr. Reed. But I'm aware such behavior would not be tolerated in other hospitals. Do you require medical attention as well, Mrs. Goswick? I have other concerns right now, Doctor. I'm fine, thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Goswick. We will only hear the words to calm the children, Ellen. As for me. Good evening, Nurse Hawkins. Good evening, Dr. Reed. To read any good news to share? You're exhausting yourself, Corcoran. Maybe you should think about preserving your strength. No, we must keep on healing all those poor souls. We are the last rampart before chaos. Once more, unto the breach. Nurse Brannigan is worried about you, Doctor. <laughs> she should not have told you that. I will have a word with her. You don't have to blame her for her honesty. <laughs> I'm not that kind of man, my dear Jonathan. Actually, Nurse Brannigan's opinion is the only one I may listen to. Do you need any medical assistance yourself, Doctor? Come on, don't be ridiculous, dear colleague. Goodbye, Doc.
I cannot enter. This must be the place. It's definitely away from prying eyes. Relegated to the shadows. A kingdom of my own. At least I won't be sleeping in a coffin. The flower's dying. It needs water. William Bishop's blood is much more unstable than human blood and shows extensive mutation. But this is not what happened to me. I must keep on searching. The so Continue tomorrow night. I have so much time now. If I'm to stay here until my research is complete, I'd better learn to hide my true nature from the mortals. But what about my thirst for blood? <laughs> <laughs> 